Is it messed up? That was me. You do better. Good morning, Besides Augusta. Well done, well done. Welcome to track two, I Got You. So if you haven't already caught on to the, uh, the motif here, all of our tracks are James Brown songs. Since James Brown lived in Augusta, right? We are the home of the Godfather of Soul, so we're trying to pay for you uh, by naming our tracks. Uh, and this is track two, I Got You. So, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Doug Burks. Uh, I do this little software project called Security. I mean, you may have heard of it. Um, did anybody have the security conference yesterday? Yes. A few people. Did you have fun? Yes. Yeah. Uh, has anybody seen our player table out there with Lenny Arcade? Yeah. Did, you, did you play Lenny Arcade? You got to. Okay, before the day is out, you got to get over there and play some Lenny Arcade. Okay, so we have some giveaways as well. So, and not just Security Avenue Solutions, but we have lots of great sponsors. Uh, so go and make sure that you stop by those vendor tables, say hello. Uh, maybe even take a business card or something like that. Uh, but let them know that you're thankful for them sponsoring these sides. Guys, our sponsors are very important. Uh, we do want to say a big thank you to Augusta University for providing these amazing facilities. Uh, so you're up for Augusta University. Uh, and lots and lots of other great sponsors. So again, make sure you stop by those familiar tables and say hello. Uh, so our first talk this morning uh, is a very good friend of mine, uh, Mr. Chris Sanders. Uh, and, you know, last year at the Security Navy Conference, which is all about this time of year, uh, I had everybody sing happy birthday to him. <laughs> because tomorrow, right, tomorrow's the birthday. <laughs> uh, he specifically requested that we don't sing happy birthday to him. But, I'm not going to ask you to. <laughs> and, and Chris swipes the sweat off his face. Uh, but make sure that you say happy birthday to an individual. So after the talk, if you see him throughout the day, just go give him a big old bear hug and tell him happy birthday. I'm, I'm keeping all these giveaways now, by the way. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Sanders, uh, great guy, very smart guy, wrote several books with more books on the way. Uh, and uh, also does this great thing called the World Technology Fund, which is also a sponsor of these sites of so thank you very much for that. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Chris Sanders. I also want to say a big thanks to Doug here. I feel like every year it's only Doug who has the, uh, uh, who gets to announce me and I would add every time I was a security in my today, I was in a huge word as well. And that was a name of it. So it was just, we just had a round of applause for those. Two. Now I gotta say, I'm really jazzed to be here. I love, my, my native Georgia, so those of y'all aren't from, I'm not native Georgia. I live in Georgia now. Uh, so welcome to Georgia, all those, uh, that are not from here. And I gotta say, it's gonna be something like 100 degrees outside. But I'll be damned to the next people today that catch the bad guys. Thank you. So uh, I don't need early morning talk, um, so we've got some stuff to give away here, so I'm going to go ahead and give something away uh, early, since uh, I think it was happening, you might still be a little bit of sleep, and, and that's fine, because coffee and whatnot. Uh, so I've got this uh, this uh, tap here to give away, to register the United Google. Um, uh, we've got an iron jacket, so we'll trivia, what we're going to do is we're going to look for the first hand I see. So we want this to tap first hand for the person to tell me what year security was officially released. So, 2008. I saw you. I saw you. 2009. No, I saw you. Uh, 2009. Bingo. <laughs> Answer is 2009. All right, so I'm here today to talk about honeypots. Uh, if I were to subtitle this song, I'm probably going to be called. Chris gives an unpopular opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, which means I may not have any questions. So, we'll see. Um, so, there's anything that y'all have asked me, obviously, I'm too much time talking about myself. Uh, I work for our, I found an organization called the Rural Technology Fund. 
We operate in rural and low-income areas, uh, donate uh, scholarships to students for swimming computer task degrees, donate lab equipment to classrooms so they can expose students to computer science and great security at a much younger age. So all things like that's the thing I'm most proud about. Uh, along with that, I wrote a couple of books. Uh, if you're interested in the topic of uh, this talk, uh, my network security monitoring has some things that I think you'll also enjoy. Um, so, uh, and all the proceeds, uh, all the royalties from all books go to uh, future charity, including the Google Technology So, today, I'm going to talk. Uh, we have an agenda, but I really want to try to tell a story. And today's talk isn't going to be too in the weeds, technically. I'm going to be too deep. Uh, really, the story I want to try to tell in this talk is all about honeypots and why I think honeypots aren't used enough in the way that I think they provide the most value, particularly in terms of placing them inside the network for detection purpose. Now, how many of you, show of hands, have ever deployed a honeypot? Now, keep up. Now, how many of you have deployed those inside your firewall? A surprising match, that's good. So certainly, we have a lot of you that I saw drop the hands that you threw on the outside of the firewall. So, that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. I'm going to frame that through the lens of uh, security economics. Um, now, certainly, all of our CDN kind of experience, I saw my talk there. I promise this is the only repeat slide, uh, but it's important here, so I'm going to cover it here, too. Uh, I'm going to put a little uh, college of Western Kentucky, Lawrence State University, on the racers. And uh, I had a really great professor there. I didn't learn a lot about technology while I was there, but I didn't learn a lot about how to think. And I asked a professor about the name of Dr. C. Rasheed, who told me, and I'll never forget this, he said, if you want to understand the world of nature, master physics, if you want to understand the world of man, master economics. I didn't really master either one of them. But uh, I, I do know that economics to realize we're in a state in information security where we have a supply and demand imbalance. The first rule, uh, the first thing you learn about in economics is supply and demand imbalance. And we have a state where we have an extremely low supply of expertise, security practitioners, and a great demand for them. And what that does is it more or less drives up the cost of everything in security. Product, services, you name it, drives up the cost, and it makes it where security is really only affordable by folks with huge budgets. Right, so you're working by 100, you're working for each company, things like that. Uh, your little guys are really, really important to play a game. And as long as it's cheaper for attackers to, to be hacking, more expensive for attackers to be defending, we're going to have a bad time. That's the point. So, I've got a few little takeaways. If you're only looking at this slide, we'll look at the little uh, tiny pot icons or uh, images here. And I want to say that I think it's not good enough for security to be good, it has to be affordable to purchase, operate, and maintain. <laughs> and that's not necessarily just a security thing, right? There's a lot of technological innovation that happens that never sees a lot of day because it's not cost effective. We've had people building electric cars for a really, really long time. They're just now coming uh, into the mainstay because people can actually afford them. They can be afford to reduce them by the average consumer. That's what we're getting. We've had space travel for many, many years. We're just now getting to the part uh, of the, now we're getting to the time where the space travel has been uh, costly to run down. We can actually start to get to the place where we can afford to ship things in space. Um, so that's pretty neat. <laughs> now, this is a slide where I make a lot of people angry. Uh, so, NSM is no different in, in terms of economic problems we face. We have a lot of different solutions out there for NSM. So, when I'm talking about NSM, I'm talking about the uh, collection, detection, and analysis. Uh, security events, uh, catch bad guys in their networks, uh, for setting security. So we have a lot of different technologies. Uh, I have this grid up here, and I call this the grid of cost effectiveness. <laughs> so as you can see, we have different squares here, and we have effectiveness. If it's far to the right, it's more effective. If it's all the way to the left, it's not very effective. We have cost. It's down low, it's not very costly. It's up high, it's very costly. <laughs> Ideally, you don't think the green box. Um, worst case scenario, we've got things in the red box. So there are a lot of different technologies out there. So I said to myself, I said, self, where would you place any of the technologies that are out there now with the assumption that you're taking the time and investing in them everything you need to to make them as effective as they probably can be? Um, so I place things, this is just me, um, and it's going to put some friends and colleagues. This is kind of where I place any of the things that are out there today. I don't think you have a lot of things that exist in the green box. Right? That's why I uh, things are so expensive, that's almost 100% for security programs, right? 
And keep in mind, this isn't just the cost of software, this is the cost of the expertise to run the software. So you might get high guess, there are free high guess out there. You need still people to build with you and see if there's things like that. So you have to figure that out. <laughs> so, uh, this is a lot of this should be too surprising. You know, the antivirus down here, uh, it doesn't cost a lot, but it's not nearly as effective as it used to be. Um, Analytics and machine learning is very kind of a new space that has yet to really prove itself out. You have to pay a lot more, so it's kind of been very, very square. Um, IDS and IPS can be uh, kind of costly, and the effectiveness can kind of vary a lot. <laughs> so, not a lot of people in the green space. Now, this probably might be spoiler at this point, but I think that any honey pots that are properly um, can be, and at least slightly in this is green flattering, uh, if you're approaching it the right way. Uh, so it's the right way, we'll, we'll talk about that more. Uh, but you may want to solve what the economic challenges we face um, with doing the detection. Now, I want to briefly go over the history of Honeypots. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, I don't think it's entirely relevant. Uh, Honeypots have been around for 30, 40 years, something ridiculous like that. A lot of great systems work on it. Uh, really hang out large organizations, defense, a lot of academic papers that are no fun to read, and I would really recommend. Uh, a lot of great books here. Uh, the famous book solar work here, uh, mentioned some honey pot type things, uh, all good stuff here. We have the Honeyman project, many of you are familiar with, lots of good development still comes out of that. Uh, there's some stuff with Google Summer Code and I'm working right now. Uh, and Honeybee was probably one of the big, first really prolific honey pot software applications that you can deploy on your network. Now, a traditional honey pot, very simple concept. It's usually uh, just a piece of software or an operating system designed to be attacked, intentionally vulnerable, and primarily used for specific research purposes. A lot of those research purposes existed um, back in the day where we were really our biggest concern were like self propagating worms and things like that. You go outside the firewall, you see what attacks it, and you kind of use that to gauge how worms are proliferating and spreading uh, across uh, the network. Um, so, long story short, it's a trap. <laughs> um, architecture really mostly looked like this, right? So we have uh, your internal network, your firewall, and then you pop it outside of it, uh, kind of fly out within the internet, and uh, what attacks it, what attacks it, you, you use that, and you can build signatures, all sorts of stuff. That's generally what traditional honey pot architecture looked like. <laughs> so now that I told you that, I kind of want you to forget it all. Because um, I think one of the biggest problems with uh, people thinking about conceptualizing honey pots for the use is they grasp too closely to the traditional notion of a honey pot. Uh, you know, medium and high interaction things, uh, et cetera. And so a lot of, uh, you know, I've got put some tweets out there, uh, kind of pro leading into this talk recently, and you just need to reply to that. This doesn't make sense. It's all this bad stuff. And so I got a few different, um, things that hang with that, right? Um, and these are, to some degree, what I would call myths. Uh, Honeypots take a lot of time to maintain. Uh, Honeypots introduce tremendous risk. Uh, what it is, hackers can use Honeypots as a foothold. They can compromise them because they have to hack your network. Uh, and four is that Honeypots are only for the most security mature organizations. Now, I say I didn't believe some of these uh, until very recently. Matter of fact, in the plot of SM, number four, I wrote it in there. I said, unless you are at the pinnacle of security mature, you should not invest in Honeypots. Uh, in my opinion, my state has changed on that. Uh, as I've begun to do more of this myself and see others do it with great success. <laughs> Not to say that you should start with honeypots, but I definitely don't think you should. But you don't have to be, um, working for the NSA or for large government organizations or Fortune 5 to be able to do this successfully. So what I want to do is again, kind of leave behind your traditional concept of what honeypot is, and let's try to build some knowledge, uh, what we think, uh, could be given the current honeypot landscape. So we're going to leave that aside and talk about honeypots for NSM. <coughs> now, the main premise of NSM is honeypot is simple. A honeypot is not a production system on your network. It serves no actual purpose other than that bad guys. So, if anybody ever talks to a honeypot, it is an alert for the event. Now, the thing is an hacker, right? But somebody talks to it. So let's say there's an RDT honeypot out there. Somebody tries to RDT to that system. That's the thing that's an hacker. It could just be uh, an errant uh, sysadmin who logged in the wrong place. It might have twice something you want to know about, right? So, uh, when we talk about service specific honeypots, there's a lot of different variants there, but in general, nobody should ever talk to a honeypot. So, after to that, um, I've already alluded to this, that it's generally placed inside the network. <coughs> the goal is to mimic the existing systems. So, if you uh, have a bunch of SQL servers, you can have a SQL honeypot, you have a web server, you have a web honeypot. Uh, RDP, et cetera. Uh, 
all the different options. Almost always, these are going to be low interaction honeypots. They are not operating systems, they're not fully blown in installations of various different tools and services. They are uh, software designed to look like them. And one of the things that they get here is, well, if one is not looking like something, it isn't that thing, an attack will be able to figure out what it is. And sure they will, but if that they're already connected to it, at that point, who cares, right? And again, nobody should have talked to anyone. By the time it connected to it, you've already generated an alert, you've already started investigating that, and nobody should have investigated any penis and not the alert. So even if they figure out what it is, who cares? Uh, and then, of course, extensive logging and alerting are going to be high to that. So if you're going to say that anybody, anytime somebody touches that anybody and you want to know about it, you're of course going to direct some type of alert to that. Uh, if you have a system embedded in there, some type of alert console, uh, security on it, put it up into the school database, uh, so on. So that's basically what we're talking about when we talk about, uh, <laughs> instant money costs. Uh, and the big one right here is number five. That's that is such a goal for me. Traditional money costs, you just kind of put them out there and you get what you get. With the goal for you, in the money bot, you have something you're trying to specifically protect. You're going to be directly conscious of risk in your environment. And I talk about risk as a funder and sexy, but when you're doing detection and collection planning, risk is really uh, the framework you're going to use to decide where you're placing really any technical of those technologies, and especially honey you know, If I make a company that makes my, uh, my living with web servers and connect with the SQL databases, and they're down for, every second they're down, I lose millions of dollars. And that's probably where my business is, but that's maybe where I want to lose that uh, from inside of the perspective. <laughs> so I had a, I had a point of interest really, so much other things that I make like this. <laughs> Uh, this is actually my wife's home town in Griffin, Georgia, just uh, the south of the land. Um, and yeah, what they're saying is they had people kind of running into this bridge, a little lower than those bridges are. So how can we, uh, how can we protect against this? And the uh, charter things that came through is you can get the bridge. So that, that seems to be pretty well to me. Um, so the big thing here I mentioned this time I'm talking about being goal oriented is that your honeypot strategy should be integrated component of your NSM strategy. Right? <laughs> And well, what's an instant strategy, right? And when I talk about it, I'm talking about collection and detection, what are the things, what are the threats I'm concerned about? Where's the risk lie? What do I need to collect in order to have visibility into those things? And what specific things I need to detect uh, from the data that I'm collecting uh, and as I go over the scale. Now, I can get through uh, any call without talking about food. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's the thing I have. <laughs> so I think about a good instant strategy like a really, really good cheeseburger. And maybe this is like a, this is like a, a Gosser or a cheeseburger. It's not the best cheeseburger, it's this picture of a cheeseburger. It's fine. <laughs> if you think about a good cheeseburger, you know, everybody likes a little bit different. You always have the perfect bun, and maybe it's sesame seed, potato bread, et cetera. Uh, you have really nice, uh, beef patties, I think it's in that, 20% wheat. Uh, not a good one. Really great cheese, maybe, you know, onions, you know, and I don't know what they should onions on this. Lettuce, sauce, special sauce, all that stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of really bad ways to build a cheeseburger. And really, if you want to do this right, your next step strategy is kind of like a really good cheeseburger. And your honey pot is a really critical component of that. So it's like an exact right place. You don't put the tomato on the bottom, then it gets the bread sauce. Everybody knows that. Right? <laughs> and it's strategy the same way. You've got to plant it, put it in the right place, and do it the right way, or else it's just going to ruin everything else. Nobody wants the song cheaper, right? <laughs> you know what happens when you don't plant properly, and you try to switch it together that don't belong together? <laughs> you know, well, I talk pizza. Did anybody actually try that all day? You didn't see me. There's a pencil in the So let's talk about honeypot applications uh, and how we, uh, how we can actually do that, right? So I'm not just, not just talking about an instant strategy, but I'm going to show you some examples of that. So honeypot, in a lot of ways, is essentially a deceptive tactic, right? We want attackers to log into the system that looks real, but is not necessarily real. It's kind of that deception, uh, which makes it sound probably cooler than it is, but I'll go with it. <laughs> now, in any given network, uh, connection, uh, collection scenario, generally there's about uh, three categories I personally love to think into in terms of what I'm protecting when I'm trying to risk. Right? Those are systems, data, and users. Right? Most things generally fall into those buckets. I think sometimes in this analysis we can focus exclusively on systems because we deal with IPs and IP for systems and um, that's just generally how we uh, how we bucketize those things. 
we often forget about the data and the users, which um, I think are of uh, equal uh, importance. Now, the process I'm going to go through when planning planning class deployment is generally uh, threefold. So that's what I have here at the bottom. So the first step is, and I mentioned this in the characters is the honey lot, is uh, mimicking reality. <laughs> right? We have a system that is a critical importance for our organization. The example earlier that was your, uh, your web servers and your SQL servers. Uh, maybe your resource organization, your resource organization is your, uh, your Windows servers that uh, hold all your data, uh, just store research data on file share, something like that. Um, maybe it's uh, a train of production systems that hold like uh, credit card information and so on. Uh, and they're accessible via SSH, right? <laughs> so we want to mimic those systems such that from the outside, to someone who already has access on your network and are scanning or poking around or whatever, they look like they already exist in the system. <laughs> so if I'm an attacker, I compromise the user workstation on your network, and I scan around those person things, and I see this array of SSA service SSA open, and there's 10 of them, ideally, they all look the same, and I don't know that one of them is the name the other nine or not. Now, at this point, if I've scanned it again, a lot of work you've done, but I'm going to say I have to connect to it. I don't really want people scanning on my network that I don't know about. Now, you know, that's where why this thing comes in. You have normal scanning processes, you have those from the detection, you need to take those scans and send the money loss. So even if the packer doesn't connect to the money loss again, the lawyer work, when they do connect to it, double the lawyer work, you probably have more greater than the lawyer work, the higher uh, criticality that you're going to look at first at that point. <laughs> that's all you really do. Risk scores and angle learning, you said, uh, score or so on, but when you hide, you know, they have 10 alerts, you only get a high of three of those levels, right? So, maybe <laughs> reality is taking, uh, a system and making, uh, honeypot that looks like that system, uh, and only using both our software. Uh, so next part is actual interaction, right? So it doesn't just have to look the part, it has to have some level of interaction. Um, in some degrees, like with SSH honeypot, someone just scans it, so if you get a send from somewhere and send that, et cetera, that's, uh, uh, that's enough to all the cases to work. But you really, it's, it's not really more than that, right? It's not enough to just say that they made it here, we can say that they made it here and they use this username. That's helpful too. Uh, <laughs> if I've got an SSH honeypot out there and they connect and they use a legitimate user's credential to try to log in, even if you don't process that to act like an SSH server, at that point you may actually know what the credentials they're talking about, you can fix them back to uh, those hosts, and that's certainly helpful. So the more interaction you can have here, certainly better, but this is under the eyes of a low interaction uh, model that you're not using actual operating systems. So your SQL honey is not actually a Windows server running SQL server, uh, because we don't want to get into the realm of being legitimately compromised, uh, having all those patches and et cetera, uh, and then the higher action users of the low interaction will be here. So we're capturing that interaction, and then we're generating our work. Some of these tools will do that for you. Um, they'll generate some type of uh, alert in a database, or some type of syslog message, or something that you can, you can send a whatever uh, alerting console you have. Others, you might want to pair it with something. So you have, uh, right the SSH example, and you want to take in how somebody connects to it. Uh, maybe you're here in that interface, maybe you have running locally, or so hovering locally here, and then here in that interface, somewhere else, whatever. Uh, you have some rules that are uh, detecting that and generating the alert. Uh, it doesn't really matter as long as you're getting the alert you need to, but you have to consider whether it's the building functionality. And even if it's not, that's okay because you can get that functionality uh, elsewhere. Essentially, uh, the, the phase you go through is moving around, you have to interact and generate the alert. So let's look at uh, a couple of examples here. We'll start with systems. Uh, so that's generally the easiest. <laughs> So in this case, we currently we have a bunch of Windows systems running RDP, and that's where our risk lies. We were doing Windows shop, and we saw all the Windows servers and all this uh, stuff that we have, or something like that. Or, uh, yeah. So uh, the idea is we're going to mirror uh, those Windows systems and make a person connecting to the RDP look like it's Windows. Uh, now, there's a lot of different tools to do that. I talk about tools a lot here. I'm going to give a big page of a list of a bunch of tools to get into this, and I'll share the slides so everyone will have that. Uh, but we're going to play an RDP honeypot. Two of the ones I really like to do in this are a Tom's honeypot, which was written by uh, Tom Wilson, who was a co-worker of mine. I worked at uh, Ingrardi, super brilliant guy, a little tight on the honeypot, and you can have it running in like two minutes. Another is Open Canary, uh, by the folks at Thieves. They actually make a commercial honeypot product, which is pretty nice. 
Uh, and most of those things, again, just look like our UD system, our UD system is going to have a good scanning. You can actually connect to them, and we'll grab some credentials and, and things of that nature. <laughs> so that's where we make reality there. Uh, in this case, both of these schools will actually set their credentials um, and capture those as well. So you're making reality and capture your interaction set at the same place. Uh, and then you'll generate all of those uh, to your SIM or view the main service provider to the SOC or to your SOC or somebody's SOC, um, et cetera. So that's probably one of the more simple examples of how to uh, use Honeypots uh, to uh, generate detection related to systems. <laughs> sort of that, right? This is the, the often forgotten thing is that really most of our business are taking that uh, systems. Um, most of our companies for that matter are in the business of creating that you know, on the industry you're in. Uh, we often think of our, you know, we're a, a research company, but we're actually an ad company, for instance. Um, so we're to that, right? so let's say we have a bunch of HR data and spreadsheets. Right? That's a pretty general thing that uh, most people have. You know, we have a different fancy CRM systems and whatnot. All our HR people still so the things that are in spreadsheets and so on. Um, I'll serve to this, unfortunately, but that's where we are. <laughs> so in this case, we deploy a uh, honey doc, but we're also maybe you know, with a honey token, which is essentially uh, a document that's sitting amongst all the other documents that have a really nice name, like, come to your social security numbers here, maybe that's payroll data, employee data, something that looks easy. So the idea is that add this in there, uh, and they start publishing those documents here, uh, a lot of a lot of the hackers will, uh, whatever we're going to open them straight up from there, and they have already access, and they're just going to open them before it's good, so they can only answer everything they want. Or they wrap it all up and they pull it back uh, to another system to open. <laughs> so what you can do is you can have a web bug in those, which uh, essentially phone home. Uh, so that's one way to do that, which is essentially like a, uh, a hidden like a one by one pixel image with a reference back to a public facing web server. So you're logging at that point on those server access events. So if they pull back to the network, uh, they open it, um, the hackers have some words to that offset, which is, uh, which is great for the blue guys. Um, and, uh, that connects back, and you have the ability to, uh, see where that's coming from, and just by very nature of getting that, you know, the document that you can, uh, take it. Uh, you also have the option of using the OS file access monitor, so just by nature of someone accessing that file, uh, or for that matter, doing anything to it, uh, or renaming it, um, deleting it, whatever, uh, any notifications, uh, for that. So that's, uh, that's another way, of course, generating alerts, uh, different ways to you know, how you do this. So that's, that's pertaining to that. Uh, to me, this is one of the simplest things anyone can do right now to start using honeypots. It's not a honeypot in the digital sense, it's a honeypot in the digital sense. This is the thing you can do. Uh, and there are online services, I think the company I mentioned earlier, thinks they also have online services where you can go and like, they'll create these for you and you can do them that way. Uh, we talked about how to do it on the high end uh, too, so there's an example of that as well. It's very easy to have created files in the round places and then just a little bit of structure uh, and all of those things like that. Uh, so we can use users. Uh, we can use users who generally get your credentials. Right, it's not the one pay you, but it's what pay most of you to have access to most of the time. Um, so there was a great um, research paper that came out by the best and very own uh, Mark Baggett. Um, he's on the road side of the game, shower phrase one directly. Uh, they wrote about uh, how many tokens in terms of uh, credentials. So if you've ever used giving hacks to dump credentials in like a test or something like that, SLO you. <laughs> right, so more or less, um, you can um, generate User accounts that are more or less no user accounts with uh, credentials that don't have access to anything <laughs> that are attached to all your endpoints. And when someone comes in and you say, they use any cats, uh, there's a, in memory, it's just a very nice version of their credentials. Uh, and you can look for that using a tool called DSET, which is a SecureWorks tool. Uh, and when you see that, that you know those credentials have been dumped, and you guys probably didn't use, and you can do some alerting on that. Right? So that's kind of one of those more creative solutions a little more to get set up. Um, but that's when you're taking users and looking for those credentials to be done. Uh, not a real user, it's a, it's a honey user, so to speak. Uh, it gives you, uh, that ability there to generate, uh, generate those alerts. So, uh, we'll get close to, uh, to wrapping up here. Um, decently up there on top. Um, so call to action. So, really my goal here, you know, I, I didn't get too deep into the weeds, because that's just really what I was, what I was trying to do here. There's more debunking myths 
of a whole sort of frame you kind of off this. Uh, personally, you see scenes in action, it can be very effective. Um, as an analyst, I'm a lot more analyst at this point. You know, single to noise ratio is what I spend most of my time um, uh, dealing with the right. Um, shooting an IDS is not a fun job, uh, it's not an easy job. Overload of alerts. I think also one of those ways that gives you a lot of really actual alerts with really little effort and really little community. And as an analyst, uh, so when you're an analyst, that's kind of what I want to spend my time investigating things that matter, um, not things that don't. So this is the part where I can draw over you and say, this is going to be like a later on. So in this case, I generally am a believer now, I wasn't this way maybe a year or two years ago, that your innocent strategy is incomplete if you're not leveraging any bots. Uh, how do you like infrastructure protection in some way or another? <laughs> Again, that doesn't mean you start there. Uh, that doesn't mean that has to be super elite of what you're doing. But I mean, everybody can use money in some way, and I'll read through some of the examples of the you guys have ideas of how you can do that, uh, to be, uh, effective in providing better protection, uh, in your network. So, uh, challenges. And I think I have challenges here for everyone. Uh, if you're an analyst in the room, uh, start looking for implementation opportunities. Uh, one of the biggest things that's going to drive acceptance of these is more people than other people about how successful they were. That's why I'm here today. Funny how successful it is. Maybe we'll try and do other people who are successful with it. Uh, we have such a strong economic problem now that all they change wherever it comes from. So, uh, managers, even if you're not technical, uh, ensure that your analysts are aware of the technique and embrace the music. Don't be afraid of the word coming by. I've had a Long career of asking people to deploy honey pots and various jobs and telling me no, and really acting like I was an idiot. Right? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting when you go from, uh, from my military work to commercial work. I spent a lot of time working for the Army. When I was working for the Army uh, as a, a, a contractor, I said, Listen, guys, I want to deploy these honey pots. They just looked at me like, I can't hide it. Then I went to the Navy when I was working for the business contractor, and I said, Listen, guys, I want to deploy these honey pots. They were a little bored. They were like, All right. You can deploy them, but you can't call them honeypots anywhere. Like, I just can't call the documentation, I just couldn't use the word honeypots. Okay, that's, that's something. And as I got into the commercial world, I've had a lot more acceptance of that. Uh, people are, are uh, looking for any solution to the deadline analysts for suffering work for you as well. So, managers ensure that this thing can find your analysts to them. Vendors. Uh, I work for a vendor. I tell this, I've been doing this all the time, but if you work for a vendor or are one, uh, start looking at ways to develop affordable honeypot based solutions. People are already doing this, right? <laughs> and applying as them, uh, I wrote that when I, the chapter I wrote on the honey pots, I called them canary honey pots. Um, there's actually a company out there called it thinks canary that does this as the only thing they really, really do is this honey pot software. I'm using the turnout because I don't want to play it with, with, with what they're doing. Um, but, uh, there, there's more than one company out there providing honey pot solutions. <laughs> Not only that, a lot of them are probably very cheap, like, uh, like throw honey pots on a raspberry pot and put it into your network somewhere with really no configuration. Uh, it's like a five minute set of things. You got your, uh, your mimicking reality, your texture interaction, your generating alerts, all in one. And that's super cool, super accessible. Um, and for a lot of people, um, you know, we talk about open source and have open sources here. Uh, and I love open source for a lot of organizations. Culturally, they're just not going to embrace that. So they need commercial solutions to drive that innovation. Right, I call it the, the NASCAR innovation model. None of us drive NASCARs, but all the cars you drive are uh, in the safety that's within them. It's because the NASCAR teams still call this and they have commoditized, uh, and shared out, uh, for use by uh, the rest of us who drive normal cars, right? So the same thing as the, uh, vendors develop things, that technology will spread, open source will cling on to it more, and we're already on great open source solutions, and drive innovation. Uh, it's how to all of us to drive that innovation, open source, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's pretty important. So I mentioned how I'm going to add some, some software recommendations here. Um, just a, just a few things that I've used personally, uh, that I really enjoy. Uh, so I've been in the I mentioned Tom's Tiny Pod, the Tom's Integrated Open Canary, uh, SSH Tiny Pod, or Tiny Pod, uh, Canary Focus. Uh, learning technology, some of these things will learn on their own, some will not. Uh, of all the great, uh, learning stuff there. Uh, most of this you can find on security and you can do the open source thing and you don't have to waste time setting it up and start there for you in just a few minutes. Uh, and in management, this is one of the things that I think is often forgotten. <laughs> we deploy a whole lot of honey pots, uh, all over the network. Um, and, you know, configuration management is a real problem. Uh, I have a, a good one working on the great DevOps people and I learned a lot from them. Uh, if you work with a remote DevOps people or without those crowds and those forms, you learn a lot about managing the 
configuration and just move these things. Uh, we can find Ansible and Operator and things and Chef and all that good stuff. Uh, it makes it a lot, a lot easier. Um, and it's really just a good idea to uh, be trying to set off people. Uh, it don't get a lot of people all around. Um, a lot of other stuff out there. I'm not sure all the items. Um, there's a really good list there. Um, uh, from this GitHub, which is a ton of them. Uh, there's like 300 listed. Um, some of them are online plus, but, uh, I think a bunch of these, uh, that are more popular here. Uh, you know, at least the slides somewhere in our But, uh, there's a lot of different options, um, if you want to get started with online plus. You know, all the interaction, purpose driven stuff. So. Um, so that's pretty much it. I think I've heard the time for your questions. If, uh, if anybody has so I'm happy to take questions or just some real little piece things that I need to get in the process. Something of the embedded web logs is fascinating. Can you go into that a little bit? <laughs> um, customize it for other circumstances like your regular work computer. Put a web log in. It's opened on this machine, you know, Delta Lear, when you go anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, I mean, web hosts, web hosts work, they, they work pretty well. Uh, I don't want to get too much of that to how to. Right now, but when this all happens, I don't want to go too in depth. But I do just look at the way out, I create a pretty simple one. Honestly, the web based creation tools, like the Think School, does a lot of hard work for you. You can customize it to your own needs, but if you stick with the web in there, you might make it look like your own visual logs and all that stuff. So, grab an app for some of your questions. The question was just about the more fresh out of the books. Hi, Sanders. Jason Smith. Hey, hey guys. I figured these mics work, so I can ask a question. Uh, you're, you have a pretty large interest in like analyst psychology and things like that, and you work with a lot of uh, pretty mature people in, in, as far as in the industry. So a lot of them will accept the answers that okay, you know, we can get over you know the old hat kind of ideas that uh, it's not safe and things like this. And they can safely set them up, but they still kind of fight back and uh, kind of follow like old uh, Twitter debacle that kind of happened with when people still arguing that. You're never mature enough to even consider any You have other things to worry about. Why do you think, from a psychology point of view, these people never like they don't really have the full reasoning out there themselves? So, I'm curious if you had their reasoning. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to go. I'm going to try that this question is always useful. Which may be not so. Hold on one second. Uh, so, I'm not a psychologist, but I actually am going to be a for a PhD in psychology, and in the middle of that, and I kind of get a little bit of a little bit, but it's just fun, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> you know, I think that if there's anything I learned in my research so far, the mind, the mind is see what it expects to see. And that kind of is pervasive across everything we do. <laughs> so, mindset is very quick to form, but very resistant to change. So many of us are in this room, especially folks who know the stuff. It is that you've already formed an opinion on many of us. You've heard it, you know that, you've heard stories about people deploying them incorrectly, and that makes that mean. Uh, and because of that, people have a healthy fear. And I would say, no, here, it's probably a healthy fear. Like, but at the end of the day, we're talking about low interaction stuff, and it's only just software. And we all know how to deploy software on our networks. Maybe not we all we should know how to deploy software on our networks and keep it maintained and secure. And any software is no different than any other software deployed. It, uh, it has a network interaction, it does some things with it, and sits some things out, right? Um, this is what we use for a honeypot, um, doesn't make it some unique special stuff, like, it has, it's gonna have vulnerabilities, right? Sure. Um, you can do those sort of stuff, maybe you can have those on your own. Uh, but I really think it's a matter of frequency, you notions know, about honeypots. Um, mindset being pretty performed or resistant change and people seeing and hearing and broken things as they would expect to in order to that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Uh, Rob. Hey, Chris. All right, so probably I was involved in the Twitter debacle with you. So I uh, <laughs> given <laughs> now we me a few years now. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to practically make a statement but word it like a question. Um, so, I appreciate the future engineers in general, and all this is stuff that I would teach my students, it's stuff that, that I plan to use, like record a video for sure. So I agree.
agree with everything you're saying up until the point on the it's just a bias perspective. Some facilities aren't well suited for it, and I don't think it's a bias perspective, it's an understanding of priorities. So specifically working in the industrial control system space, there's no way that would ever encourage an industrial control facility doing power, electric water, etc., deploying out a honeypot in their environment. So I think just for a aspect on we didn't get to have a full conversation off of Twitter. Now, sort of now that we have each other in person, what are your thoughts on certain industries not being able to do it for safety reasons, not so much cognitive reasons? Sure, yeah, yeah that's a good question. I answer that specifically from the psychological perspective, but what I also learned in psychology is that, uh, well, it's like I said, I made before, we want to understand, humans understand economics, right? I think it's all about economics too, right? Most of these ICS networks, you know, you're going into them all the time, and they barely have a staff to keep things running as it is, right? Security, I mean, you mentioned in your talk yesterday, which is a fantastic talk, <laughs> talking about their number one goal of operations, and when more additives are caused by squirrels and cyber attacks, like, that's what they're going to spend their time against, right? <laughs> so, you know, network security in ICS is just really, people are just now experimenting a lot of people with visibility. I wouldn't expect that to be gross in any class. I do think Honeypot's can be a good idea in an ICS environment, um, with the right folks in the right places. But I respect the fact that there are certain industries that have different priorities, and a lot of us are used to it, and because of that, they, they're struggling to do some of the other things right, and they got to focus there before they think about these things for sure. So I agree. Hey, Chris, Brian Gens. When it comes to how many people in the organization need to know about the Honeypot, versus how many you think they need to know. Um, have you come across the topic of OPSEC or operational security and had some of those barriers or perspectives, maybe the asset management folks, or people that maybe aren't under, they don't have that compartmentalization mindset? And have you seen resistance to the idea that only three people need to know about this? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand that. Yeah, absolutely. So my, my perspective is if you're deploying a deception platform, um, that we, we probably don't want to put a lot of documentation out there that might proliferate around a large organization uh, so that you know that itself could be footprinted. So I was just wondering if you've come across that OPSEC concept in this and whether you find yeah. that relevant. Okay, yeah, absolutely. I understand that. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the thing. You don't want to, if you've got, if there's like document team you know, out there, you don't want every employee knowing about this code because they're going to like treat them differently. You might make them in their own folder. That is going to be hitting the most of the crowd and don't be able to do that. Now, I don't think it's too much concern in the sense that the first time you have an employee who actually like, opens up a honey dog and then they can call them the sock. They're pretty much going to hire that point where they're wrong, and, uh, uh, and that's kind of the best feature, to some degree. Uh, obviously, I'll say it's a concern with stuff, but again, in most of these cases, once the attacker does anything in relation to them, you just like send the send package to it, um, you're already, your, your spider sensor should be hot a little bit. So, the thought of having to like ask honey pots too much, or have been looking on honey pots, isn't as much of a concern, I don't think, when you're doing like the style of low interaction about the model, so. Hey, um, as far as ISC and Honeypots, they actually do have ISC and Honeypot. It's called Conpot, and I thought it was interesting that... Is there? Okay, just want to make sure. No, yeah, yeah, they it's, it's, it's there, and they do deploy it. Um, in the Honeypot conference I was in this, this year, that was one of the big uh, discussions about ISC and Honeypots. Yeah. That's what I saw Rob there. Yeah, I spoke there. Um, it was about research honeypots, though, not deploying them in terms of the ICS environment. I, so I don't want to, we can talk about it after. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Tom Bradshaw. Um, I noticed up on the list there's probably a little over a half dozen commercial vendors now that are entering the deception market space. I didn't see them up on the list, and a lot of customers are clamoring for a high interaction capability, even though they're probably not well equipped to deal with the information they'll pull out of that. What, what are your thoughts on the commercial vendors coming out and where they're going with the technology? I'm not as familiar with the commercial higher stuff, but I'm really to believe like I, I work a lot of companies and organizations and since coming here, I was like the thing with the socks. Like, I really think they're good at higher action and stuff, and those are the degree that you can manage. Like, I like I don't want to make that. Uh, that's higher action and plus bringing a whole different story of their actual functional operating systems, actual functioning applications. And I know you're saying you can do a lot of those things now, but 
I mean, at that point, if you're managing an operating system, the question you ask yourself is, do you trust that vendor to manage an operating system within your, within your network? Right? And maybe you that's right. Maybe you don't have to say, I'm not familiar with the system, so I can't, I can't see that as much. But I mean, that, that is, when you're in a realm of high interaction, you're going to that whole new realm of problems. Anybody else? What's going on Just grab me after the fact. Um, so I have a copy of the hacker playbook too. Yeah. <laughs> this question is going to be an off security question. First hand, I see you said, who, that doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> who was the first coach at the University of Kentucky to win a championship? Bobby Knight? No. I'm not passing. I saw it right there. That's right. They all fell. Everybody give it up for Chris Singer. 